must learn how to keep the church on fire we must learn how to keep the family on fire you must learn how to keep yourself on fire i have duty to keep church on fire i'm not going to listen to what anybody says the forces of darkness shall not settle here again one day people will rejoice with you your story will change 100 percent God stands and stands firm. Now, a number of scholars believe that Psalms 116 may have been written after the exile, for which they have difficulty tying it to David. But many more, from their research, drew the conclusion that it is also one of the Psalms of David. And they had drawn different scripture passages that has allusion to the set of things that are here. I also believe that this is rightly the psalm of David. Praise the Lord. We have our different ways of responding to God's goodness or when something good happens to us. Not just here, but when we look at humans beyond this place, you will see that when something good, when something great happens, our reaction to it, our first response to it may be very different. There are people, when blessed, so much have just been done. The first thing they think about is, how to enjoy the blessings, how to use the blessings. You see somebody tell you, I am relocating to a better part of town. I am moving to a bigger house. I am changing my wardrobe. I am changing my car. I will commence going on vacation. Things have changed. But for the service we are reading here, his first and rightly, the proper response is, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits? The enjoyments will come, the use of these things will come. But for him, what shall I render to God for all his benefits? Some others, when it happens, their mind will go off what has been done, the things provided, they will cast their minds on the ones not yet done and the ones not yet provided. They will think something like, oh God, I wish you also did this one, that one, the other one. This package would have been complete. My testimony would have come perfect if only these other ones had come. But for the psalmist here, it didn't matter whether all have been done. But for the ones done, the question he came up with is, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits? Some of us, when it happens, they go off themselves. They are looking at another person, what has been done for that person. You got one car, and you are saying to God, we were classmates with Johnson. He got five. But the Sabbath says, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? What shall I render to the Lord? For all his benefits. I've not seen two persons who are exactly the same person. I've not seen two whose times are the same. Our times are not the same. Some went to school early. Some didn't go early. Some married early. Some didn't marry early. Some got vehicles so early. Some didn't have early. Sometimes those that had it early, much later they lost it. Some others who got it late, they continue on and on. God's plan for each person is special. 
God's plan for each person is original. God does not do mass production. Millions upon millions. The earth had hit 7 billion living. No two persons are exactly the same. If the dead will rise, it will still shock you. I try to wonder, how has he done this? How has he done this? If all those that ever lived will rise and come back, you will still see. Each human being is unique. I am myself. You are yourself. My time is mine. God given. Your time is yours. Also God given. Praise the Lord. There are others when it happens in that manner. They wonder, oh God, do I deserve this? This is so heavy. This is so much. You see tears of joy. They think, what will I give to God? What will I do for him? We cannot pay him. We cannot give back the things that he has given to us. Each time I settle down to think, I see the set of things that are not material are heavier in the things that the Lord has done for us. Praise the Lord. For the psalmist, he attributed everything done to God. He didn't say it was himself. He didn't say he was strategic in his planning and thinking. He didn't say it was because he did prayers. In fact, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits? And when somebody is asking himself, and perhaps others, what shall I render to the Lord? It means he was at a loss what to really do. I want to praise him. I want to glorify his name. How do I do it enough to capture the things that he has done for us? I told you here in church one time, the first time we went for prison fellowship, very cold time. And when we got in there, we saw prisoners with that stuff they were wearing then. Now that they have changed the names and the rest, perhaps they may have changed uh, the clothing. They were hitting drums and, and worshiping God, thanking God. I stayed looking at them. <laughs> I stayed wondering. These people are thanking God here. They are worshiping God in this place. After this fellowship, we will go through that gate and they were going to remain back here. And perhaps only them will know and those in authority what time they will be freed from that place. Yet, they had reason to be giving thanks to God. And those of us who were free, who came to visit and go, we probably may not have had that kind of mind. What I'm saying this morning is, if you count your blessings and name them one by one, it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Needs don't ever finish. They don't ever end. They don't ever end. There are some blessings if God brings to you, your house will become inadequate. Immediately, <laughs> you quickly, you need a house. And it's a good thing that is bringing it. There are some that will happen. You see, you are not running helter skelter. What do I do? I need somebody. I need to employ somebody immediately. So needs don't ever end. From time to time, we need to settle down to say thanks to our God. 
If you read that place, he mentioned few things, but I'm not concerned about it. My own thinking is, when I don't find that I can pay for what God has done, when I find I can't give back in any way, I will offer my heart unto him. I will devote my body unto him. I will offer my time unto him. I will offer anything, whether they, we call it talent, or we call it gift, or we call it skills, or we call it learning, I will offer them to him. I will offer the substance of our leaves. Sing unto him the much I can. I will give thanks in form of prayers in any way possible. And of course, whatever substance there is, which we are here to do today, we will also give unto our God. Praise the Lord. Sometimes, the act of thanksgiving, the act of appreciation, are taught children from infancy. Somebody gives something to a child, you tell him to say thanks. Some grow up without learning it. So they learn it in their adulthood. How to say thanks. And I'll tell you the truth. Some had missed opportunities. Some had missed getting more. Because they didn't learn how to say thanks. They didn't learn how to appreciate. They didn't learn like one of the lepers healed by Jesus. How to return back. To say thank you for what you have done. For somebody like David, acts of thanksgiving brought him more from God. And I believe it's the same for us today. When you give thanks, more comes from the person who you are saying thanks to. When you give thanks to God, he gets obliged to do more for you. For somebody like David, acts of thanksgiving, he learned it so well. Acts of thanksgiving made his relationship with God to grow stronger. That was one man king he was. But he doubled as a prophet. He doubled as a singer. He got so many things about God. He said, I won't give to God what cost me nothing. It has to touch every part of my being when it is going unto God. Praise the Lord. And the one that I have continued to see how to learn is the fact that this relationship with God, which acts of thanksgiving together with many other things brings, makes one accumulate grace. The grace he gathered was enough for his children, 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 and even more. Not only for himself. As he lived, it wasn't by strength. God did much more for him as a person. Maybe it may be good we read 1 Kings 11, 11 to 13. That therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, I have not kept and have not kept my covenant and my statute, which I have commanded you. I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. It says, however, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. 
Praise the Lord. Solomon's sin was heavy. Very heavy. Try to imagine 700 wives. Okay, in order to be fair, let us assume that 200 of them were of Jewish origin and they were worshippers of God. Let's take it that only 500 were hiddens. And for each of the 500, a shrine was built. The priests that served there enjoyed their pay from state coffers. Think about 500 shrines in Jerusalem where the temple of God was and different priests, prophets, all kinds of people were parading there, acting. God was angry and he said, what you should face for what you have done is to get the kingdom out of your hand. But my hands are tied. I cannot go this way because there is something I see. The relationship between your father and myself. The promises made to him. The man had died. He was no longer alive. But God says, for his sake, it's painful in my heart, but I will keep looking at you with these 700 women, with 500 of them having shrine. You must complete your tenure. There is power in grace. There's power in it. So much power in it. He said, I will not tear this kingdom out of your hand in your time. You were the closest to your father. I will do it in the days of your son. That is the second or third generation. And when it was to be the turn of that generation, he said, when tearing it, my faithfulness will not allow me to take the whole kingdom. I will leave one tribe not for your sake, not for the sake of Jeroboam himself, but my servant David. And when this was done, you will see concentration of the work of God, concentration of the power of God, concentration of divine surveillance centered on that one tribe. And if you read Kings and Chronicles, you will see times where God will still repeat. There must be a light for my servant David. Along the line, he made it permanent. I will raise a son from his lineage, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will keep this light for his sake all through the ages for life forever and ever because of the way he served me. His worship, his thanksgiving did not end with him only doing so. He had to write songs himself. He had to compose himself. He had to create them himself. If anything happened for God, he treated it differently. When he danced and danced and his wife said, you dishonored yourself. He said, it was before God I was dancing. 
If it were to be in a party, my dignity as king will be preserved. If it were to be at an event, I will put myself and keep myself and parade myself and carry myself as I should. But before the almighty God, I am nobody. I will dance if it makes me look like a child, I will do so. If it makes me look like one of the servants, it didn't matter. Because it is before God who made me king. God who chose me, who saved me, before him, I will dance and even do the more. God said to him, you won't be the person to build the temple for me. A normal average person will feel, oh, I wanted to build this for God. He asked me not to. But for him, although God said he shouldn't, he still had to design what the temple should be and kept. He had to raise money from himself for the temple and kept. Before dying, as his son had become king, he challenged all the leaders. Everyone came giving money for the temple, but God had said, don't build for me. Your son will build. This is the kind of heart we are talking about. He said, what shall I render to the Lord? For all his benefits, for all his goodness, for all that he has done for me. God does not overlook such people. He does not overlook such people. Did David face problems? He did. We are there trouble sometimes. They are where? At a point, his own child chased him out of the kingdom. He had problems. But at the end of the day, just the way we were thinking as children, we felt when God will judge people, he will look at their sins and look at their righteousness and then see which one is bigger <laughs> and, and determine which way, which way the person will go. <laughs> when you check the troubles, the disappointments, the pains, they were tiny. When compared with the goodness of the Lord. Again, for some of us who are positive, even if there is one item that is good and there are three that are bad, I am among those that will want to fix my mind on that one that is good. My reaction will have to be based on it. My thinking will be based on it. I find strength in it. I find forward moving it. I find spiritual progress in it. He never charged God for evil any time. He said, before I was young, now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Nor his seed beg bread. He was saying to people, God is faithful. God is faithful. He is faithful. He said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. If he got in there, it made so much sense to him. Whether anything was interesting or not. Today, brothers and sisters, as we ask ourselves like he did, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits? I've run through what it can be. It, money is important. Material things are important. Very important. In addition to them, our lives, our hearts, our training, our skills, those things you know how to do, God need them in his house, in his service. Our time, 
our devotion. He has need of them. He values them a great deal. And if we bring this together with the things we have that are financial and material, they will will up to him as a sweet-smelling server. And when it happens, like the case of Solomon, who offered 1,000 bond offering when God had finished blessing him. When next he was offering, he was offering 120,000 animals. This is thanksgiving service. It's also a prophetic meeting. At the time we give thanks in an annual gathering, we also lay foundation for something coming after that. Because I believe God who brought you here today, as you give thanks from the depth of your heart, he will make you be and live to be here or any other place next year to also give thanks to him better than it is happening here today. Because weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Country will not remain like this forever. And our economy won't be like this forever. We hope this message has inspired you. Thank you for watching. To other for this message, please call 080 God bless you.